Uh, welcome again to everybody and thank you for being available and um, as I think I will probably say a number of times during this during this meeting um, the sub when we get the subcommittee work um, it's been great to see all the activity and um, it um, it's it's very heartening to uh, see the time that everybody's put into this and uh, we still have a lot to do, but I, uh, I'm confident we will get our work done. So, um, the point of this particular meeting was uh, to, uh, it's not a timeout exactly because it's an official meeting, but we thought it might be helpful if we could have a time when we could just uh, discuss commission business, so to speak, uh, see where we are where we're going, uh, what else we need to do. And uh, there are a couple of particularly important uh, things that I, th I think we need to sort out in this meeting that are uh, uh, the commission business portion, of course, and that has to do with, the, with public input. So um, let's go to the first item of commission business and uh, Start first with the February 25, 2021 and March 11, 2021 meeting minutes. Um, I'll start first with the February 25 meeting minutes, which have been distributed uh, to everyone. Um, are there um, any uh, corrections uh, to those? So hearing no corrections, those minutes are approved. And I will then uh, have us turn our attention, please, to the March 11 minutes. And I'll ask uh, those have also been distributed. And I'll ask if there are any corrections to the March 11 minutes. Hearing none, then those minutes are also approved as distributed. Uh, both sets of minutes are approved as distributed. Thank you. The um, next. Uh, Next item up on commission business is the disparity study. Um, and Dr. Uh, Ramsey and uh, county representatives uh, provided a very uh, thorough and thoughtful uh, report to us. And I think everybody's gotten a copy of the, of the disparity study. And uh, what I want to do is to see if there are additional questions to be submitted to Dr. Ramsey, uh, additional questions to be submitted to Baltimore County on the uh, issues uh, arising uh, under and connected to that disparity study. One of the things we uh, may very well want to do uh, is have uh, Dr. Ramsey back uh, as we uh, as we. Uh, move forward on this and I'm particularly be interested to uh, hear from the uh, uh, from what for shorthand if I may I'll refer to as, as the MBE subcommittee uh, when we get to that part of the uh, that part of the commission business but are there additional uh, questions that um, uh, that if they haven't been submitted yet to uh, Jasmine and Elizabeth any additional questions or thoughts or the like yes Dan yeah thank you um, I think Scott Phillips and I are the uh, code revision subcommittee, unless somebody else is joined. So I would ask Dr. Ramsey for what recommendations she would make to the code, which is deficient in numerous areas. And and Carla and I uh, are on the uh, are the uh, subcommittee on sustainability, and it's really deficient there. So I, I think for this important topic, it would be helpful to have. The, the code is the Bible, I guess, or the working plan document. So what I would like from Dr. Ramsey is what code revisions, what would she write originally? I don't know if it can be revised. What would she put in there to um, deal with these issues in the code at the level of the code? Thanks. No, great. Others, I know, uh, I know, Scott, you, you've submitted a number of, uh, a number of questions. I don't know if, you, if there's anything else, uh, Mary Dixon, Carla. Pete. Well, at our subcommittee, we kind of had some discussion and um, and I think Carla, <clears throat> uh, I was going to say Nelson, Chambers um, <laughs> probably has that list um, based on 
just issues relating to the structure, uh, the manpower. There's a whole host of items that we discuss at the subcommittee. So I don't know if Carla wants to kind of highlight that or give a report on that, which sure. would have been additional things we had. And and it's and you're right, Mayor Dixon. It was so much. Um, we're not quite ready to report out when it's time today. But that but in the writing of as opposed to doing executive orders, we just believe something ought to be done from a legislative position. Um, I will say that. And so, in talking with with Carla Tucker and Troy, we have um, we have what that should be. And, and and I've sent that information to the committee members. And I then I and for the committee members, I got some more information tonight. So um, ours isn't so much on the code side as much as it's in addition legislation, so that it, it becomes law, and that's where we would be. Um, I will say though, when it comes to Dr. Ramsey, and I asked about possibly her speaking to us on some things. I, my understanding is, if we do, she may charge us. I don't know. So, um, in the ask of having her to come. I don't know if how that works in reference to her fee, because I was told if we were to ask her that, that there may be a charge. So just as a FYI around that. So this is Elizabeth. I I do want to chime in here. Can you hear me? Because some yes. yeah yes. okay. So actually, in the in the spirit and and letter of procurement, we are trying to figure out how her contract could possibly be extended to include some additional work. And I know. That, Jasmine and I have both been on emails. The CAO is looking into that. So it's it's um just again honoring the original contract and and we're looking at that. So we're we're, we're, we're we hear you and we're on it. Great. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> anything else on that uh, on that particular topic about questions for uh, Dr. Ramsey? Elizabeth Jasmine, anything you wanted to say about about that particular piece of no. uh, um, I will say, Madam CAO just really enjoyed the conversation and the questions everyone asked. Um, and she's, I mean, we've said this repeatedly, but she sincerely is excited about the recommendations that this commission is going to come out with. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with Elizabeth to see what additional information that Dr. Ramsey may need in advance of her next visit, but um, I think it's just a matter of sorting out the procurement and we can get it scheduled. Okay. All right, well, let's, uh, let, let's turn to subcommittees. Um, and um, uh, I don't think we're looking for any uh, formal submission. I mean, Carl asked me, to, you know, is there, a, is there a deadline for submitting something? And there there isn't, I just wanted to, that'd be helpful if we could hear um, what the uh, subcommittees uh, have uh, have been doing, what they are looking at next, where they um, could use some help or some additional resources, any other uh, thoughts they have about the uh, commission's work and uh, thoughts about people that uh, we should hear from uh, as it might inform what the work of those committees um, is. And uh, so- Bill, Carl, can we can sure. we start since we're, we were talking about disparity and we can stay in that vein and I'm, I'm asking our subcommittee to chime in if, if they would uh, there are some pain points immediate pain points that we have discovered um outside of the fact that the mbe committee or i'll call it an office for lack of a better word outside of the fact they don't have a budget they don't have the proper staff in place to do the enormous of what amount of work that they have to do and they have some immediate uh, fire there's some fires that's going on right now if someone is sick if someone has to um if god forbid somebody passes or if someone retires or leaves then you only have one person and that's carla and carla right now is burning the candle at both ends from the middle literally and uh, and having some conver in, in having conversations with her and Troy about some of the data we're trying to collect, I can hear the express, the angst in her voice because she's overwhelmed because every by every agency department comes back to Carla if it's around 
um, goal setting, if it's around asking questions about a solicitation, she, you know, she may send out the solicitation has nothing to do with the MBE, but she was the outreach for procurement. So all the questions come back to her uh, or, or one of the questions, there was a solicitation that went out that I saw on Emma, which is Maryland's um, eMaryland marketplace uh, board. And when I read was there, there were no goals on it. So I asked what happened to the buyer and to Carla and the buyer didn't submit the information to Carla like she should have. So now they have to go back and do all of that. And because it's a, it's a, it's out on the street, she has to stop everything else she's doing to put these goals on. And that's with at least five solicitations because the proper uh, procedures were not handled. We're not, you know, so that, that is a, it's a, it's a, it's a crisis situation in this department right now. And um, while we know there's some recommendations, while we know they want to hire, you have to make sure you're hiring people that understand not just procurement, but the 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 whole the whole uh, minority business piece, and you know, setting the goals and everything that goes around that. And those people are not, <clears throat> excuse me, easily found. And then you know, it's so there's a without getting into the weeds today. I just know that they are dealing with a lot of issues. It's all on one or two people. And if that per the one person is about to go out, so that means it's all on Carla. And to manage that for the entire county and to manage COVID, any COVID business um, aspects, that's just a lot. So I don't know what we can do to help for some stop gaps, but it's critical. It's, it's critical, so. Um, we're we're going to have a lengthy report, and I'm asking my committee, and my committee is pulled in a lot of different directions as well. So while we may not meet in a Zoom environment, I'm trying to get them the data that I'm getting from both Troy and Carla, and both of them are overwhelmed. And um, anything we can do to help to help them, even in the short term, would be grateful. Um, for instance, just and another quick thing, and I'll stop. Carla says she had surgery. Um, sometime last year and she was out for three months and that's why the disparity study was delayed and I said well what happened to that work she said I worked from home while I'm on sick leave to get the work done because there's no one else to do it that's not good and mind you that was last year during the pandemic and she's still trying to you know she's working at 11 11 30 because I'm sending an email thinking I'll hear from her tomorrow and she's answering me at 11 o'clock at night and that's you know you can only do that but so much before you burn out so I'll just leave it at that for right now. <laughs> right. And the only thing that I would add is that <clears throat> I'm doing our subcommittee meeting as we kind of um, digested the information from the disparity study even a little bit more. It was very clear that um, why probably the information of MBEs, WBEs, um, Et cetera, and why companies have the perception for Baltimore County is because if you have an office of one person, literally, you can't be successful. And so, with the disparity study and the information that was provided, uh, there's a whole lot of revamping that really is going to need to be done. And we kind of discussed that what if you had this kind of layer and these folks a part of your team? You know, and just going back to the city's MBU office, you know, even though they had the downsize, they still still have more people in downsizing than what Baltimore County has. So it, it's a lot. Pete, I think you want to speak. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to absolutely and. Um, hang on, Carl. I think Pete, I think okay. Pete was going to speak. Go I'm ahead, sorry. Pete. Okay. I, I just want to say, Philip, did we not? Um, did you see? Uh, in May, you have to give an interim uh, report. Uh, if that's the case, maybe uh, in that report, one of the top items, because I feel the same way that I think the uh, MB office is totally understaffed and they need some help immediately. I think maybe that might be a, a priority to see if that couldn't be addressed at uh, immediately uh, after the with the May report, rather than having to wait to the end of the entire report to get help because it's almost a whole year. And uh, certainly if something happens in that year, uh, it's gonna be that much worse. So I would suggest that in that in your uh, interim report in May that this be addressed immediately. 
That's a great idea. Uh, lots of people are nodding their heads. Carla, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to, to Sheila's point, where the city has an IMBU office, which is under the Office of Law, where and um, in the mayor's office, you have the advocacy side, which is the piece that I had, and then each agency can monitor those contracts that come back. Those let's just call those three. Carla is all of those plus more. So she's doing all of it and it's just not going to be successful. And to Peter's point, the fact that it's an immediate need, though, they're talking about hiring some people in FY 22 in July. What's going to happen between now and July? Um, and I, I was almost thinking about calling you on a sidebar to say, what can we do to help? And all and, and in addition, from what I understand, while the CAO, um, Miss Stacy does realizes there are some issues, especially with, as it was around PRISM and how many functions they, they were not using in PRISM and they are working on that. And we heard that in the report last month, but um, Carla hasn't had a chance to sit down with Miss Stacy Rogers to say, this is what I do, which is why she put that out in an email to us, to, to her and Troy, so the committee were, was, uh, saw it and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you're, she does it all. And um, it's almost like there's an immediate need now. I was, you know, can they hire a consultant to help that has this kind of knowledge to help out? Where, if you, if she was to give up something, what would it be? And that's where you skew into the procurement department to help. They're asking those buyers; they need to, at minimum, put their name on a solicitation when it goes out. Don't go out asking for something. Ask Carla to send it out, and everybody calls Carla because the buyer didn't put their information. Something as simple as that would be helpful. And I don't know how we can get that back to, I don't know if Elizabeth, if that's the issue, but just something as simple as that to tell procurement, put your name on a solicitation when it goes out so people can contact you directly, even though Carla is still also kicking out the solicitation and them not call her, so. Yeah, and we have to remember too, that even if we hire, if someone gets hired immediately to help her, uh, there's a, a still a training phase that, yes. Uh, it could be a few months before that, that person really becomes effective. So, yeah, and maybe, may I suggest, a, at first I was thinking just one, but one may not be enough. So I would uh, I would ask for one immediately and then try and follow up and see if uh, a second uh, person, because I think the disparity report, then the, they were looking at something like seven people, right? And maybe, and maybe that might be a little, uh, a lot to manage for the county, or a lot to uh, a huge expense. But I'm, I'm sure that uh, anyone could see that uh, one or uh, two people at least is not uh, should not be a problem. But anyway, that's that's my opinion. Sure, Peter. Uh, to underscore uh, the other comments, because the topic also came up in the subcommittee with purchasing, uh, and uh, Carla was. Uh, part of that as well as Steve, um, remember that there was a position uh, in the MBE operation that, that resigned, a person resigned in 2015, and that position was never filled. Um, also remember that Carla told us that her, you know, second in command um, is eligible to retire now. And given workload pressures, why wouldn't he? Um, and Carla uh, will be eligible to retire, I think, if I remember correctly, within the next two years. So uh, Carla's saying one, whatever, something soon. Um, and the burden that she's carried, you know, has been enormous. So I just wanted to underscore my agreement with that. Um, I can tell you, I was going to say that's a good point because trying to get something in early as you move the process forward, particularly with all these folks potentially retiring, you, having that structure set up is only going to be beneficial to the county. Dan, I think you wanted to say something. Just to echo what everybody else has said, but uh, again, going back to the code. Um, there's nothing in there about MBE. There's a non-discrimination clause, and then at 10-2406, uh, 
way down at the back, it says uh, in D, the minority bidders shall win if there's an even, if the price is the same and one's a minority. In other words, there's nothing that really goes into the, um, you know, full robustness of what a program ought to be. So I, I agree it has to happen at the code level, the legislative level, the operational level, all these levels, because if anyone drops out, it really doesn't work in well, its entirety. I'm a, little, I'm a little confused with what you're saying there, Dan, is because I thought uh, Kevin Kamenetz had uh, had put into place a uh, pretty much uh, robust uh, MBE program. Uh, and I remember being part of a huge meeting at the in some auditorium where he laid out everything that was required. And I thought that was all uh, well, voted upon and, and legal and, and somewhere in the Baltimore County uh, code. Yeah, I'll just defer to Elizabeth or somebody who knows the code, but I'm I'm just reading off the code that we were handed out on our very first meeting, this Baltimore and County code on purchasing. Right. That's not it, in there. It's obviously it, the code I, mean, I think I think the meeting he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. The, um, Cabinet did things by executive order. Okay. Um, Correct. It was out at Towson at the West Tech or whatever that high school's called. I think I was at the same meeting, and it was most of the things that were done were done by executive order. Oh, okay. So, but that, absolutely that executive correct. Executive order is still in effect. Is that correct? Executive orders can be, you know, rescinded and at any time. time. I, but at this point, it's still in effect. Yeah. Yeah. It is still in effect, and um, from what. What was more important, the things that they said, but it it ought to be reflected in the code as well. That's all I'm saying. Well, I, well, I, agree. I, I don't see that. I, Phil, oh. go, go ahead, go to Elizabeth. No, I heard my name twice, so I'm going to try to respond in backwards order, delegate. Um, so I think I'm hearing two things. One is that there are things that have been either initiated through executive order or otherwise a matter of practice that perhaps would be in code. And obviously if we hear back from when hopefully we get more time with Dr. Ramsey, she could opine on it, but it sounds like the commissioners have a sense that more things, there need to be code revisions to reflect these things. And I would think that's a bucket of recommendations, both interim and final. Um, then I also heard there's a super urgency even before a May report saying that Carla Tucker in particular and probably all of purchasing are seriously understaffed. I have no idea if we can address it before the fiscal year, but it could be put in a question format uh, that sort of, you know, that we're going to send back through the response to the disparity study and or to the CAO. Again, not promising anything, but I think if it's of that magnitude, maybe waiting till May 31 is too late. But well, if, there's a vacancy, yeah. if there's a vacancy, couldn't that it, um, position be dealt with more immediately to deal with some of that? If there's a vacancy already there, even before the budget fiscal year? That sounds like a question that could come through sooner, Mayor. <laughs> And and, yeah. and with that, um, one of the things that Carla suggested is just what I mentioned earlier about having the buyers take on more responsibility of their job. Just something, I mean, th that could be an internal memo or whatever that procedure is to tell the buyers, please put your name, phone number, email on these solicitations to have people contact you directly as opposed to them contacting Carla. Um, that, I think, is a quick fix. And that's between, you know, MBE purchasing and just, you know, putting that together. The both purchasing, I'm sorry, and those agencies, because we have learned that everything is not centralized. So they're just going back to the report that PETA has, whoever the buyers are that are putting things out, own it. <laughs> own it. Yeah, that's a good point, because just this week, there was a bid that went out. I sent it out to some of our members because it dealt with hand sanitizer. And in turn, they sent it to Carla and me. And I was like, don't send it to me. You got to send it to Baltimore County. And Carla came back and said, hey, the, the purchasing person has to deal with that. So that's a good point. You know, since I kind of went through that just this week, because it was something that was needed immediately. And I, and I think yeah. it also comes think back to the fact that uh, they were, it was mentioned before that the uh, purchasing agents and, and buyers need to have some training in this arena, and that, that's got to be a, a priority recommendation as well. It, it goes to the question, uh, if I could, I wanted, I'll to, get to, Peter. I wanted to address um, 
uh, Dan, when you talk about the code, uh, interestingly enough, the where you get all of the guidelines for the MBE program is in the purchasing manual, and the code refers to the manual, and the code actually allows the manual to be the um, overriding document, if you will. Uh, for for final determination on how uh, a matter is to be addressed. Um, so the county is a little bit different in that. So if you want to know what's yeah. going on with the MBE piece, you got to go to the purchasing manual. The um, second, here too. <laughs> yep, the, the second piece um, in this, as it relates to the whole situation about staffing and how we figure out something temporarily or how we figure out something structurally and maybe this is an early recommendation. I had asked the consultant last month about um, how do we measure and monitor at the department level. If the purchasing agents and the departments have some responsibility for the MBE program, it will it will uh, definitely change the way uh, people view it um, and the goals that are set. Uh, everything at that point then gets pushed down to um, a more granular level. Uh, if we wait to rely strictly on the um, MBE office, I think we're gonna continue to have this challenge. So I wanna, uh, Peter's been waiting very patiently, so I wanna give Peter an opportunity to speak, but maybe uh, we could also segue into uh, your subcommittee, Peter, because we're talking about okay. uh, resources, uh, human and otherwise, and I think that might be a good segue. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, to, and to echo what Scott was saying, uh, not as urgent, but um, also important is the idea that came up in my subcommittee, which is, and I think in our larger group as well, which is this accountability within the using agencies, because they're the ones where the needs are initiated, identified, and so on. Uh, they need to be trained in the whole procurement MBE thing, which they're not getting now. Uh, somebody needs to be designated to be responsible and, and thus accountable. Uh, and I'm sure there are you know, seven different ways uh, to cut that. Um, the issue of now going back to just the subcommittee uh, conversation, um, the staffing issues in the purchasing group are not as critical um, as in Carla's operation of three, um, but they certainly are uh, very, very severe. And there's only one person who has a procurement related certification in the group. So that's uh, the training is another issue. Um, in spite of that, uh, um, Rose uh, and Carla say that they have a good camaraderie and morale within the people that work together. Um, we have shared, uh, I should say, uh, the staff has shared a lot of really excellent information with us. So we know that they have uh, um, stellar capabilities. So we've looked at the training materials that are uh, that have been used, the slide presentations that are used for training from both um, Sue and from Rose, and uh, they're excellent. Um, of course, with COVID, they weren't used at all last year, and none of the people in the agencies are getting this training, which is what I referred to earlier. Um, the training, of course, the training needs, of course, also go outside of the county to the external training that the purchasing people uh, need. And uh, this brings me to one of the things that we're still waiting for, and that is budget information. I've asked uh, to see the purchasing uh, operations budget for the last three years, including the proposed budget that's currently under consideration to be included in the county executive's budget, as well as last year and the year before. Um, with all that they have going on, we, uh, they still haven't been able, the staff still hasn't been able to really pull together comparative information from other agencies, which we have talked about before. And that is something, uh, Phil and Elizabeth, uh, where help could be uh, useful just to relieve that 
uh, burden. Um, so my group has um, met um, in Zoom, we've had telephone calls and a lot of documentation uh, received and shared. Um, Rose has also put together a, a progression plan of this is what it's going to take to grow her operation. She's even put together some job descriptions, uh, position descriptions. So, so they're uh, available and ready to go. And this is work that was done previously, but just never was budgeted or never uh, pursued at all. So I think in terms of having things to recommend, um, we certainly <laughs> won't lack for those. Great, thank yeah. you. Yes, Dan. Okay, thank not, you. Not to beat this dead horse uh, unconscious, but um, you know, this is the purchasing manual we got. The only addition on MBE was this, which is from 2009, Jim Smith being the county executive. So I heard Kevin, that's his name. If there's other documents, I don't want to waste any more time working on documents that are not the latest. I trust that we've gotten the latest. So if there's an update on MBE or anything uh, by executive order that's now part of the purchasing manual, and I'll talk with Scott offline because we're going to do the code part and I'll try and understand better how the manual and the code interact. Um, but that's that's the only thing we got that has MBE in it. It's not in the rest of the purchasing manual, and it's just this one document that was signed in 2009, which is, after all, many years ago now, and probably needs a review. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm so, I'm with you. So so do we? So um, Elizabeth, Jasmine, do we? Uh, can we go back to double check? Because I want to be sure. Obviously, we all want to make sure we've got the right predicate of documents and a complete set. Um, Yes, I can go back and cross reference that what they gave me was the most current um, because the executive order too should also be on the SharePoint site that speaks to the MPE. Um, but yeah, I will close the loop to see if there's a more current version. Great. And if you would uh, do us a favor as well, um, whatever you pull together, maybe put that in a separate um, MBE uh, folder so we can go to one place and see everything collected that uh, uh, speaks to that issue that is the current law of that uh, issue in the county would be, uh, that'd be helpful. Be very helpful. Will do. Okay. Um, I, I want Dan to please, uh, Dan has uh, volunteered for a number of committees, which we appreciate um, and sustainability. I think that that is, uh, a subcommittee that uh, should have more than two people on it. Uh, and uh, we're looking for volunteers, or I will draft someone. I uh, want to be involved with each subcommittee, um, but I also don't want to leave Dan and Carla on, the, on their own. So if there's somebody um, to get a volunteer, I, I know we're, we're down to commissioners. Um, there is a rule that says those those who aren't there might get volunteered, but if there's somebody else who's interested in doing that, because that, we really need to pay attention to that, I want to get. It's uh, funny you should mention that, Phil, because yes, when Carla and I met, we had a chance to chat. Um, yes. We both came to realize uh, that we have a person on this commission who we both worked with on environmental issues in the past, and that would be Sheila Dixon. I was, I was going to say. <laughs> Long past. That was, I think. I was, I was, this is before I That's got an office a long time ago. That's how we met. Before I became mayor. Yeah. Before and, you, and you and I were great on that. We, it was the Baltimore City County Task Force on Recycling. And my councilman was then council president, Dutch Rupersberger, and he appointed me to that. And that was my, one of my first forays into politics. I went to City Hall. First time I was there, hundreds of people were cheering. But then meetings two through 12 was Sheila, me, and someone who took minutes and whatever we did, and we set up the program that's still operating to this day. And Carla knows Sheila from another environmental experience. So, you know, I don't pick anybody you like, Phil. Uh, I don't know. There may be a favorite. <laughs> let, let me, let me see. I, well, they, they can put me down. I'm just, we, we're fighting. Uh, I don't know if Rick is on, but we, we had this big campaign about PLA, so it's consuming me, but I mean, I should be able to help. Uh, that'd be great. That, that, would, that would be great. Dan. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Dan, you make my job so much easier when you point these things out. That's great. I just give a little, little past history going back uh, 25 plus years. That's all. That's how long Sheila and I have been working together on this. Do you want me to run through the, uh, what, what, or Carla, do you want to, do you want me to do it on the, the, uh, our meeting? Okay. So, so we did meet and, uh, unfortunately, Steve Lafferty got his signals crossed and didn't join us, but Megan Bennett of his, his sustainability staff that's remained did a good job. And she also referred us to Rick Keller, who sent us a uh, ton of information, all of which I've shared with Phil. We've kept Phil in the loop on all this yes. stuff. Thank you. Um, and then I asked Jasmine to post it for everybody. I took notes from our call and I'll just run down those quickly. Um, code needs to reflect sustainability and green in all things. And each department should develop standards to its own unique circumstances. So what IT does is going to be different what, than what uh, DPW does. Fleet vehicles for hybrid and electronic should be assessed. Obviously, some vehicles are going to be more appropriate. We were discussing that uh, the, the parking meters, parking ticket vehicles are all close. Obviously, it's going to be different than, uh, than some uh, you know, police cars necessarily or some other. And that every department would have to um, do that. Um, we discussed some things that aren't directly related to the procurement uh, task force, um, but I'll run down a couple of them. Uh, Carla brought up eco districts, eco districts.org should be encouraged. That allows neighborhoods to kind of take on their own environmental uh, perspective. Uh, food waste should either be delivered to food and secure areas if still edible and safe or disposed via compost. Uh, buying recycled whenever possible, given um, both cost and uh, function. Um, this is something that uh, we talked about, but also um, Mr. Keller talked talked about in his comments with uh, us and in the material he sent that everybody has to have a mechanism to track the data for this a sustainability data system. So you know where benchmarks are, and, and they're going to be different. Um, public trash cans should be separated for waste and recycling, as is done at the airport. DWI, you see two trash cans, not in. eliminate plastic bags done in Baltimore City and elsewhere. We could have our own thing. Um, considering buying and then reselling recycling bins to residents and requiring apartments and office buildings to recycle. Again, not that. Um, we thought, you know, engaging in youth was important. And there apparently had been a youth climate working group and a youth climate summit in the past couple of years that uh, really engaged a lot of high school students, the future, their future. And they came up with a whole number of recommendations. And Megan's going to be sending those to us, but maybe that could be reconvened. Uh, promoting uh, rain gardens, permeable paving, and similar plans in all construction procurements, requires schools to put on solar panels on the roofs. Actually, I did legislation on that, and so did Senator Chris West this session. I don't know the status of that, but Chris West did. Schools are ideal for this and, and tie this requirement to BCS funding or in some uh, you know, funding to the public schools. Uh, schools are ideal. They're not occupied all the time. They have flat roofs. There's usually not trees. They're not more than three stories tall. Typically, they're not occupied all the time. And it's a great educational thing. You got a lot of roof space there. You're not going on to farmland or something else. Uh, plant trees and minimize mowing. mowing. But all solicitations basically should have a sustainability component that could include credit. You show a sustainability element or a, either on the purchasing or the reusing or however it's defined that you would get bonus points uh, along the way. So um, that's pretty much Carla. If you'd like to add anything, please. Hi, thank you. And um, just to go in and dive a little bit deeper, we are going to have a meeting with a, a, a minority business that deals in um, solar panel tomorrow. They're gonna to tell tomorrow. us the work that they're doing in Baltimore City and in Howard County. And, found, and I found out that they actually bid on some work in the county a couple of years ago and did not win it. And, and I think it has something to do with waste management. I'm not quite sure, but they're going to explain that piece to us tomorrow. In addition, I, Dan, I did not get a chance to tell you, but because of the work I was doing in um, Atlanta's airport around the, their whole green initiative, which is how I learned about eco districts, there's a gentleman by the name of Tony Johnson He's the senior executive director of the University of Alabama's direct division of finance. He used to work for Walmart and they have, he has an, an entire bandwidth of how you can even take recycled material and, and make money off of it. So I was thinking about asking him to come and possibly talk to some people in the county about how the county, when you take your paper, your cardboard, 
And usually when you're taking it, people want you to pay, but he's shown, he's shown organizations, um, municipalities and corporations on how to make money on recycled material by, yes, I see Steve Welch. So um, there's a lot, a wealth of information. There are green conferences and everything on a lot of best practices. So if we could find ways to make money for the county, that would be great. I see Steve wants to add. Well, I'm not sure everybody knows, but the, the county actually does make money on its recyclables. So, okay, all the Good. recyclables that the county picks up go to its facility in Cockeysville, and we actually um, the markets go up and down. At one time, we were making a lot of money up there, but now we're we're breaking even. But a lot of other jurisdictions are paying to get rid of their recyclables right now. So, it's out there, and the county had, uh, does a really good job of it. I think one yeah. of the one of the, the other things. Is, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say quick. Sure, go ahead. Go one ahead, of Carl. the things, Dan, when you were talking about um, the the information that Miss Bennett shared with us was about the composting, and um, about changing maybe some of that rule about composting because so many people are composting at home and how we can you can lower your carbon footprint just teaching people how to compost in their um, in their own home with their own um, fruits and vegetables, different things that are compostable. And, you know, just trying to change some of those rules as well. I just want to say that that it's it's often at least more in the past and hopefully not now that people have been tagging that um, this conventional wisdom is that being sustainable and green costs money. It's costly and actually it's it's not. So, you know, everything from electric cars to you know, lights, uh, solar panels, green buildings, all that stuff um, actually are substantial. Uh, benefits financially, let alone environment, which is important in our health and all that. But um, yeah, so I think that it's, it's another aspect to it and, and there's no reason it can't be done in, in every component. And obviously the different components of how the police department might look at it may be different than, you know, the, the parks and recreation, but it can be applied everywhere. So yeah, that's where think, we're trying to go. Yeah, so Dan, I have a uh, interesting comment and I want to pick up uh, where Steve Walsh uh, left off, you had mentioned about um, uh, having different bins for recyclables, uh, you know, maybe like paper or pans or whatever. But uh, I did take a tour of the recycling facility here in Cockeysville, and I was wondering, and I had the same question, why Baltimore County doesn't have a separate waste stream for these type of things. And it turns out that the recycling facility in uh, Cockeysville separates all that out. There was no need for the homeowner to separate all that. They can put it in the same bin because when it gets to that recycling facility, they have ways of being so separating the metal from the paper and everything else. So it's really interesting. So I would encourage everyone if you have a chance, and I think sometimes they do a tour through there um, to 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 go there. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, Pete, that's single stream, but we're talking about separating trash. From the single stream recyclables, not sorting the recyclables among themselves. Oh, okay. So just right, to okay. clarify, so if you, if you have a glass and a can, they can be in the same package. Plastics are pretty complicated, but um, yeah. uh, cardboard, you know, all can be single stream, but not putting trash in the same. And the, all the public trash cans that we've seen, the few that are around, do not have a recycling component and a trash component as they do at the airport and many other places. That it's a small thing, but that's. That's it. Well, it helps, it helps control the litter problem that's, you yeah, know, right. that pops up here and there. And, <laughs> and real quick, if anyone is interested in joining our meeting tomorrow regarding um, solar, the solar panels and things like that, let me know and I'll invite you to the meeting. It's from 11 to 12 tomorrow. So just send me an email and I'll invite you. So but before, thank you, thank you all um, for that. Um, so before we move on from sustainability, um, I don't know if the subcommittees had an opportunity yet to identify anyone or maybe the subcommittee, if they haven't, could look at that to identify someone it might be helpful for the full commission to hear from on this topic, the sustainability and I current. would say Rich Keller would be. Um, he's okay. currently out of work. He's written manuals. He's taught courses and I think and Megan Bennett again, not entirely parallel to the MBE situation, but there's an opening where Steve Lafferty moved over to planning. So that that sustainability department is Megan Bennett, who's about two years out of college and she's really smart. Yeah. Obviously Thank needs you. some more people too. Yeah, so I'll just chime in for a minute. I mean, Megan is a, essentially an, 
you know, as you said, two years out of college, she works for me now, and I'm glad she was able to brief you on her work, but I do think Steve Lafferty should address the subcommittee. I, I think we want to, you know, be sure that we stay within the procurement realm. And I do think we could plan to actually to have Mr. Keller appear before the whole commission to talk about green purchasing. So I hope we can do that soon. Um, and um, I, I just, I think while it's really helpful, we hear a, a range of ideas. I think um, his presentation will be in the purchasing area. Um, and also I know that the solid waste work group, which Madam CAO is chairing, is addressing some of these issues as well. So um, we should plan for a meeting where things that are within the commission's scope are addressed uh, by the appropriate internal people. But I would add that Steve Lafferty should be heard from at some point, and I'm sorry he missed the prior meeting. Yeah, I think he just got his uh, calendar screwed up. That was a normal thing that we all do from time to time. So yeah, so set him up with, I think Steve and Rich should talk to the whole group, not just the subcommittee, because I think there's knowledgeable on the top of the game on this. That's great, thank you. Um, and Dan, do you wanna, uh, there's a, another one I promised you that I would bring up because it is important and it's the uh, purchase pooling. Um, I have, I'm, I'm holding here House Bill 1400 as enrolled and a copy of the fiscal policy note. Um, and, um, we, uh, I don't know that we've heard much so far about purchase pooling generally, and I know that particular uh, bill is addressed to to uh, healthcare. Uh, thoughts on who else we might want to hear from about that? When I say hear from, in terms of the, the commission, Dan, I, I I think what it takes it now is um, plain detailed legwork. The legislation is enacted um the county buys health insurance for its employees the state buys health insurance for employees somebody has to sit down and go through you know call the state up say show us your package there's timing issues there's benefit plans there's costs there's COVID, all the things that make health insurance complicated and it's complicated but in the end what you want to do is have them side by side and compare them you also have to talk to the key stakeholder groups teachers for example or police firefighters the uh, you know, the, the unions um, obviously have, a, have an interest in this, but, and at the end of the day, if you do that analysis, which requires going through a lot of details and presenting it, and it turns out to be worthwhile to piggyback with the state, you can do that. And if it doesn't, then you don't. But common sense would tell you that if you're buying for 80,000 people, which is what the state does, they probably get a better deal than what the county does buying for you know five or six thousand and anecdotally everybody i know that's worked for the state and the county always says the state health insurance was the best plan ever so it, it not only frees the, the it gives better insurance for the employees at lower costs and also the county doesn't have to maintain to whatever degree it does the hr department that's out shopping health insurance because that gets shifted over to the state the legislation allows the state to charge a modest fee but it's going to be less than what the county's paying for operations, and I don't know if the county uses insurance agents, it would be less than that, which is always going to be four, five, six percent off the top anyway. So um, it's 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 um, having to do the work. I, you know, it's straightforward and it's worked. By the yeah. way, many states, not quite a number of states, do this now. Fifteen, twenty states, the state buys for everybody because there's small counties that don't have leverage. Medium counties like ours simply don't compared to the big things. So. And there was a report that uh, the bill also generated a report and the report, which is extensive and had all the stakeholders able again said, yeah, the county's local governments will save money. Maryland Association County supported the bill. I mean, but the county have to act. You got to do the, 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 the lifting of going through the analysis. Yes, yes, Peter. I think you're, I think you're muted, Peter. Um, that sounds more like something that we would recommend as part of our report. It doesn't sound like work that the committee is going to be prepared to do. I think you're right. right. Okay. But, um, but, but, but double been, checking. But, but I ha I've been bringing this up since before, before the procurement committee at our first meeting. And what I got was it's being is the only response. My one response was two sentences going to the office of law. I mean, what I really would like to hear is that there's going to be a group put together to do the analysis because it's a big ticket item 
and you save one or 2% there, you save a lot of money and you do it in per for a long period of time forward. Uh, but, you know, that's what I'd like to hear that there's going to be a work group formed and it's, you know, it's going to bring the stakeholders together and do the detailed analysis. And there's insurance agents and people like that who can, who can do that. Steve, did you want to say something? Steve, go ahead. Oh, you're muted now. Yeah, just, just to add real quick background, um, the county did go through internally um, some some steps over the course of years to make their pool larger. So they went for, for a while, it was just county employees, and then they pulled in uh, the library system and I think the revenue authority and then to try to get that pool bigger. And then they had done some, it had an internal work group to try to get the best, um, have the best healthcare procurement. And that was done not too long ago. I know they included members of various departments and the unions and things like that. So there has been efforts over the course of time, but I agree with you, Dan, obviously the bigger the pool gets, the better the costs get. And um, I think at some point the administration just needs to decide whether that's something they, the direction they wanna go. But I agree, I think we should make the recommendation. Thanks. And I think it should be a strong recommendation. So, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, um, do you want to? Um, well, let me go back. And Elizabeth, I would really like to hear back. You have a chance to take that back to some of the folks that you deal with. That, I, can, you know, um, I can tell you that the efficiency audit. Okay, it's now being called an efficiency study because it's not an audit. Uh, but that project I've mentioned several times. It kicked off a month ago. They are looking at potential cost savings in the health insurance area. I ha I do not know what approach they will recommend, but any first step is to hear back from them. Um, in the next month, few months, it's a 6 month project. So we will hear back soon. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Steve, can you make as a. You know, you guys have been busy. Sure. Um, yeah, we had, a, we had a meeting actually had a small meeting with Pete and I before other um, um, subcommittee members were, were named. And then we had another meeting. Um, basically, we had a good discussion about a variety of issues, but the, uh, the main topics that we're going to follow up on are um, on call contracts um, and that'll be on the construction engineering and other services type uh, contractor pre-qualification and that's both on engineering and, and construction side the the standard construction contract itself and rick rick uh had some some ideas on responsible contracting language he wanted to further discuss um, uh, and with along that was the uh, uh, prevailing wage and local hiring act that the county uh, just recently approved that some further discussions about that and how the county thinks that's going to be implemented if they've had much thought about that yet. Um, contract administration and vendor payment on the contract construction side and then the final one was AE procurement. I threw that in because I know a lot about it. Um, so we have six basic topic areas that we're going to follow up on over the course of, I guess, the the, the term of this engagement. Um, I developed a little schedule that I need to amend that I haven't talked to our subcommittee yet about. But um, we, uh, my hope is to schedule another meeting here real soon to to get into our first topic. And I know we we sent some co uh, questions to um, I think Jasmine to follow up with purchasing on. Uh, so that was our first topic that we we're gonna dig a little deeper into on the on-call contracts. Um, so yeah, we think we have a, a path forward. Um, again, I get think there's a lot of overlap with with uh, some of the other subcommittees, but we'll, we'll, we'll dive into our work and then see what comes out of it um, for um, discussion with the broader group if there's anything that that comes out of those sub subgroup meetings and that's where we are wonderful and yeah i checked in with rose earlier today her and property management and i believe dpw they're all compiling those answers so hopefully i'll get them to you pretty soon great um we're not sure yet we will need to meet one more time whether we need to pull folks into a subcommittee meeting i was hoping just get answers and then us talk we may need to and I'm thinking Chuck Ingram from construction and 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 uh, maybe Deb Schindel from property management about the on-call uh, issue. But um, 
my hope right now is to get the information back and then have a meeting and then we can just decide uh, amongst our subcommittee what what direction we need to go with future meetings. That's great, Steve. Thank you. And one of the things that a couple of notes I've made to myself here is um, it already sounds like there are a number of uh, rec uh, recommendations. Um, uh, some immediate recommendations. So, uh, let me talk offline to um, Elizabeth and Jasmine about um, the logistics of the interim report and take back from that May 31st deadline when uh, we would ask the subcommittees to offer those who have met and you know, some will be meeting more as the process goes on. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, I can't uh, help myself. Uh, the lawyer in me says the, the code piece and the manual piece are uh, uh, obviously important too. So my point though is I'd like to set up some uh, realistic uh, and practical deadlines to get uh, subcommittee recommendations. Talk, let me think a little bit more about um, sort of the format of that. So that, that can be used to put together the interim report to say, here's what we've looked at, here's who we've heard from, here's what we here's what we intend to study in the next six months. Uh, but lo and behold, we've already got some recommendations and uh, here they are and um, we uh, are hoping to uh, get action, as they say, um, uh, sooner rather than later on a number of those. So uh, let me work offline with Elizabeth and Jasmine and get, get back to the rest of the commission with some proposed, some suggestions. And you all then tell me whether that's realistic or uh, unrealistic and we'll, we'll sort it out and work it out, uh, work that out that way. Um, I'd like to, if we could move to the next, uh, on the next topic. And, and again, thank you to all those leading the subcommittees and all those participating in the meetings. It's really terrific work. Thank you very much. Public input. Um, I've had an opportunity to uh, talk to a number of people. Uh, Scott and I uh, spoke uh, in the last couple of days about this, uh, and I'd like to have a discussion now. What I'm talking about public input is um, we have heard uh, from uh, mostly people who uh, work for Baltimore County and they're wonderful, but we need to hear now from what I would call the other stakeholders, which are the, the people who, uh, do business with the county, uh, haven't done business with the county, but would like to, or feel stymied for whatever reason from trying to do business with the county. Uh, we need to collect that information. I think that's very important. Um, and, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the logistics about how we might do that. Uh, but a number of suggestions uh, put out there in terms of uh, well, just how we might gather that information. So, um, Scott, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you've had some, uh, but I will. Um, but I know you've had some recent experience. I think in, in, in I think in the context maybe of uh, Baltimore City and gathering information. So. Um, any suggestions or thoughts you have, and of course, I want to hear from everybody else as well too. But if you wouldn't mind leading us off, um, and you're 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 muted. There we go. Thank you, uh, Scott. You're still muted. Scott, you may have to check your audio options and see if you're connected to your laptop, to the microphone. Take, take your time. Mr. Chair, while Scott's trying to chime, can I jump in real fast? Please do, please do, Steve. Uh, um, Elizabeth might be able to help, but I know the county has done numerous outreaches to get public input on a variety of big, big topics like the budget. Um, I think, uh, unless I'm totally wrong, you guys have the, the, the infrastructure to be able to put out uh, a poll or survey with various questions and get responses back from the public. Is that is that wrong or am I right? Uh, 
I mean, we can do, we've done all the above. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, we've, we've gotten pretty adept at getting input, um, but if, um, so we could put a survey out. We, uh, and we can invite, we can, as we've said, do a public meeting for the commission. I mean, these are all public and open, but to gather people who might present, we lately have been calling them round tables. We've been doing them this week and next week for the economic recovery sub cabinet where we invite like 16 people. Usually we only get half and they engage in a discussion. Um, well, that's one format and we do it virtually. So whatever the commission wants, we can make it happen even virtually. Yeah, but my opinion, the survey is a, as a, as a first start and that, that can get out to a whole lot of people. Um, at a minimum, that's that's my opinion. I think a, a well written survey can get a lot of data. Uh, can I can I be heard now? Maybe please. We we can hear you, and we'd love to hear okay. from you. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, Stephen. I think that's great. And and the way the county has been going about the town hall meetings and gathering information that way and allowing people to join in um, uh, virtually has been great. What um, Phil and I talked about most recently. The city has been going through its disparity study and as part of its disparity study MTG, I guess, is the consulting group. Uh, they conducted a couple of um, uh, um, hearings, if you will, I'll call them hearings, uh, and they just took testimony from individuals. Uh, folks were given about three minutes to just share their their story uh, so that they could gather information about what um, has been taking place within the Baltimore City program. Uh, and I think they did two sessions about an hour and a half each. Um, Sheila, I don't know if you, excuse me, Madam Mayor, my friend over there, I don't know if you Sheila's fine. <laughs> I, yeah, I was on actually, well, they interviewed me separately. Right. But I also sat in, listened in on um, one of the interviews and it was good because the companies were very um, straightforward, honest, made recommendations, concerns that they had. That was a good process. Yeah, so I shared that with Phil. I thought that was a good process uh, to, to, to gather information. I don't know that we should rely strictly on that. I, I, like uh, Steve said, I think the the idea of uh, sending something out and getting feedback is a, is a good one. Um, I did say that um, <laughs> my, my experience managing the planning board for a number of years uh, suggests that we definitely need to keep control if we want to do something like that. Uh, we keep people to some limited time frame and we give them the opportunity to share their piece and we ask them to come prepared uh ho hopefully with written statements um uh to, to to gather that information so that was my thought that was my most recent experience thanks scott uh, others have suggestions thoughts what could work might work y yes pete so um baltimore county i think is uh has uh, County Council, made up of councilmen in certain districts, right? Um, are they aware of what we're doing here uh, as far as on the purchasing commission? And could we uh, email them or send them information if they don't of what we are doing? And a lot of them have their um, own newsletters uh, that they send out to, or information that they send out to their constituents in their own councilman district area. So, I mean, uh, they might be, uh, might be helpful to seek their help in uh, trying to get information uh, through those areas because um, it is a diverse area in Baltimore County and then you can be sure that you're getting uh, information from all areas of the county. Sure, that, that's a great idea. I think we, also, we can be sure we get yeah, sorry. Uh, the larger, the larger, as large an area as we can for uh, because obviously we we are Baltimore County, but uh, as we, we talked about with respect to the disparity study and and just sort of common sense as we've got there's a larger group, but that's a great way to gather some information. It, it's a um, as I've talked to several people about um, on on the commission, uh, there may be some reluctance um, to step forward in a public way just because of concerns that that could affect. Uh, how a potential contractor is, is viewed, but we want to be sure we get as much reliable 
uh, real experience evidence as we can. So other, other yes, yes, Peter. I think uh, Ms. Rogers uh, was very pleased with the survey that they did recently about uh, trash pickup and recycling and what have you, that the response rate on that was very good. So I think that has a lot of promise. So Elizabeth Jasmine, the logistics of the survey, um, what does that look like? What, what would you need from the commission? Uh, what does that look like in terms of timing and um, actually uh, review and collection and organization of the data and responses? So from our experience, I mean, the survey design, sort of what we want to ask is definitely input we need from the commission or would be preferred from the commission. We definitely have all these lists and outlets, but I don't know that we're going to be, we may not have the ties that I know has been mentioned by commissioners to the networks they have. So we're going to, we're honestly to get the right information, we're going to need input from, from you all. And then we can get it out and we can collect. It's less back end, it's more front end on this one. If, if that. So I don't know if there's a subcommittee that could help us inform what to ask and then also give us your, your networks to push out to as well as ours. Dan? Yeah, well, we have a councilman Wade catch on it. I think Pete, Pete's point's good. They all send out newsletters where I live. There's, I get two or three because of the geography. So, um, and that's great. But I, I do know that uh, I think it's Debbie Risper who is in charge of all the um, county executives, local people, Michelle Bernstein here in the second councilmanic district. And then they have, they network with everybody, you know, churches, synagogues, mosques, chambers of commerce, uh, neighborhood community groups, community associations. I mean, they really are on the ground and, and that would be a good way to, if you want to, if you want, if we choose that we want to get the word out to that level, those people have the databases and there's seven of them. They all work for the county executive through, uh, I think it's Debbie Risper who manages them all. So. Yes, actually we've switched there, but I agree. Um, we definitely have that network. P. Chris Cumas now runs that unit. I guess that is a question you actually asked what I was going to ask. You know, is the general public, depending on how the survey is structured and of course what we want out of it, is it really something the general public is going to respond to? Maybe. I was thinking it was more a community of, of potential bidders and contractors, in which case we might catch them through our usual venues and chat channels and I don't know that we will and I I see I know we had a conversation where I think some folks on the commission have listened and 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 avenues we would be best off using for this survey if well, I can just jump in I I'm, I know Carla has the e-list but the, the county should also have a regular vendor mm -hmm. list yeah um, of, you know and using those two Absolutely. probably our two best avenues mm -hmm. I think we should push it out to all for this reason. We don't know who we don't know. There's people, you know, who just never got into this. Think of doing stuff with government or they're entrepreneurs or they're thinking about starting something and they wouldn't know. And secondly, even if the general public does, you know, gets it and then doesn't do anything, that's okay. So if, if I got a thing that said, hey, my county executive is really interested in procurement efficiency and saving money and, and, and doing the right thing by all communities, I'd say, great, I have no interest in it, but it would register in my head that my my county is doing something. Otherwise, it never gets to the larger audience. And we don't know who's out there. What small businesses just never even bothered, aren't aware. And so I think you have to put a big message out and people that aren't interested, which is gonna be 99% of, 95% of Baltimore County citizens. So they'll hear about it, that's okay. And the few that you know we drag in that have not participated will, will be to our benefit. So I, and since it's all email, it's not like we're putting out $10,000 worth of postage. You know, just that lo the, those, those local county people, I mean, they know everybody in the district. They, they know the grassroots. That's why they're there. I, I, thought each, I thought each commissioner would get a clipboard and we go to designated parts of the county and take a survey that way. Okay. Um, all right. And then we can incorporate, yes. yeah, we can incorporate, we can provide like the database from MMCA. You know, I've already gotten feedback, but you know, them getting a survey and answering it, um, we can send it out ourselves to them or incorporate it within the, um, some of them are on the 
vendor and procurement lists. And, and, and we would do the same to the MBDA network and the uh, city's network of MBEs, um, both those that are certified and those that are non-certified that are on the list. Uh, I, I think once we put the survey together, Elizabeth, to your point, the bigger issue is figuring out what we want in the survey. Uh, getting the survey out given uh, technology will not be the challenge. I agree, it, because Carlos includes the Baltimore City and her list. And then I've actually had um, someone who what isn't on either list, but had applied for a bid solicitation um, and had some questions about, you know, how did it happen the way it happened and everything. So that's the catch all where if you're not on one of these, you know, um, other lists that the other piece that people are talking about, this is a catch all list for people who outside of certified, you know, um, databases can still be captured. And, and I wanted to make a point because Phil and I talked about this earlier this week. This is not just, we, we need input from a broad array of stakeholders. So it's not just the MBE community. Um, that, and we just need to make sure we understand that. I just want to keep that in mind. It's great. I, I just wanted to say, yeah. I, that I agree uh, with Dan's assessment of uh, trying to get a uh, uh, large a group of uh, diverse people in the county so uh, everybody can participate. A lot of people won't answer and that's fine. And I just wanted to mention that uh, however we set up the survey, I, I would prefer to see a survey that's more open-ended, okay? In other words, you put a survey out there for yes or no questions or choose, you know, one of these five things. I think it limits a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things that people, you know, may want to say, but and if someone is strong, uh, strongly uh, has a strong uh, feeling about something, if you leave it more open ended with, you know, just a few questions to get them thinking, um, it may be a better survey than, than say 20, 25 questions that you know, we don't, you know, may not even want to spend the time to, to look through that. Yes, Steve. Agree, and I, th I think it, it has to be both, right? You'll you'll have some questions where they can score one to five, good and bad, current practices, and then at the bottom you just leave it open ended. What do you suggest? Any suggestions for improvement? And then they'll give you a lot of information. Mr. Chairman, would would an idea be uh, for each subgroup to discuss questions and then submit them to someone to coordinate, or no? That would be an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you. And I, you know, one other thing, and I hope this won't sound odd. I've been calling everybody by their first names. I, I do, I do defer to the mayor, and I think I've said delegate or Dr. Mark. Um, I could call everybody commissioner for you. you tell me, I, I'm it's, the informality. I hope is okay with everybody. First name I, is fine. I, first name is fine. All right. Well, I hear, I hear, Mr. Chair. Um, if I ever hear Mr. Andrews, I think my father's in the room, and that's that's a scary notion. So. Um, so, okay, good. Um, yes, Steve, that would be great. Um, and I would ask the subcommittees if they would, they would do that. Um, and I know the state, um, and probably everybody knows this. Um, if people show up at a pre proposal conference, but decide not to not to bid or not to participate. There's a sort of a list of questions about well, why, why didn't you participate in them? Uh, but I think it would be helpful if the committees would do that. So, uh, does anybody have any experience with the logistics of, I should say, survey design? Like the like the old joke, somebody says, "Who plays the piano? Well, I play the piano. Good. I need a piano move. And you're you're just the person." So, um, anybody know about that? Okay, because um, I I do know that there's a there is science writing surveys. Yeah. Um, if anything, I'm on the I'm on the receiving end of of re, of trying to answer surveys and I just sent one back to Towson University today as they were asking about women in business about the pandemic and it was more skewed to being employed and even though they had a question about entrepreneurs it was it wasn't skewed right so that's why I liked Steve's piece on 
you know, one through five and then open ended or give me an NA because it doesn't apply. So there is a science to it. Um, I don't know if there's someone in the county that does surveys that can assist us with that, but I'll, you know, short of paying somebody to do it, but it would be nice to, to, to have someone that knows how to do that. Uh, I figure I figure Elizabeth and Jasmine are experts in, in so many things, including <laughs> surveys. <laughs> Just add another I hat think, to them, why don't you? <laughs> no, no, I'm trying. I'm thinking of a survey we did on transportation about a year and a half ago that didn't elicit much. So I'm not. My track record's not great, but I think the survey that was referred to by the, that the Solid Waste Work Group did might have been designed by consultants. Am I right about that, Jasmine? They have a consultant actually, advising. And yeah, I actually do not know who did their survey. Um, I answered that survey, though. It wasn't bad. It was a couple of missteps, but it wasn't bad. It was a pretty good survey. I mean, do you think we could adapt it? I didn't get it or see it. I'm just trying to make this simple for all of us. There is a science to it. Um, um, but Jasmine, I don't know if we have. Let's ask internally if anybody's good at this. Because maybe I'm missing something. Will do. All right. And so um, to follow up uh, Steve's suggestion to subcommittees and uh, mm -hmm. any what what's a, what's a reasonable um, deadline so we can at least gather the questions to figure out what, generally what we want to ask about and then the the science of wording it and figure out what what fits in the rate one to five and then what what's best in an open ended question. Uh, can we say, what, what you all tell me, um, go, go ahead, Pete. Uh, could we just do it uh, as a first order of business at our next uh, 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 subcommittee meeting? That way we get it out of the way. It doesn't seem sure. to be a very difficult right, thing to do from a committee, subcommittee point of view, but we could do that as a first order of business and then, then we have it. All right, and, and then for getting it to the, uh, to the, Everybody submit to the commission. We will yeah. we'll submit it to Jasmine and Elizabeth uh, and to me, and then we'll we'll get it organized. So maybe uh, and I want to mention another thing about the survey design and everything. So I got to tell you, the last five or six surveys that I've been a part of that I've responded to have all been by, I guess, Survey Monkey. It's a it's a <laughs> free. Uh, I guess it's free. Um, I don't. I've never been involved in it, but uh, I. I, I see it, and I, I don't think there's any cost to it. I don't want to see us spend a lot of money to do the survey, but if we could use something like that, if anyone has experience with it. Um, uh, it survey it monkey is good. It's in reference to how you write the questions. Right, exactly. So that you get the answers that you want. And then I'm thinking um, maybe we could solicit an intern from a, a UM, you know, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, and it could be a project they could work on. They can get some credit for us or something. I'm, 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 I'm throwing out. Peter, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I'd appreciate if uh, Jasmine or Elizabeth could send us the survey that was used for the solid waste uh, work group, so that we have you know something that worked and some, give us some ideas to use as a basis for our thought process. And then when is our next uh, commission meeting? April the 8th. Okay, so that's uh, two weeks. So if we get something uh, back to you, Phil and Elizabeth, what, by next Friday, next Monday, the, uh, the following Monday? I see. The I see. Fifth? I mean, that, that's that's fine. I mean, is that something everybody could do? I, I saw saw Carla shaking her head. I check on Friday. I was just like, not next. No, no, no. <laughs> that's all. Yeah. Why, why don't we Why don't we have Why don't we try to have every everything? Because um, uh, it's going to take a little while to launch this. But what it would be helpful if um, before the next meeting. That information is to is sent in by the subcommittees. Um, give us some time to collect it, and then we'll I mean, to, to organize it and, and and get it out. I think I'm just trying to think just in terms of timing and what it takes to pull all this together. Um, 
I, I think that's more more realistic than trying to get something jammed in by the end of next week. So does, does that work? So um, let's say by uh, let, let's let's try to have the information in by. I'm trying to when we could look at it. I mean, yeah. Let, let's just have it in by. Let's say by April seven, we'll see where we are. Uh, people, we can at least have a general conversation about what what. Uh, the, what the subcommittees have come up with, and then we'll get it packaged up so the commission can look at it. In the meantime, um, we can see what this other survey looked like and um, give that some thought. And then, what about the idea of a of a uh, of a public meeting? That is where people who want to come in and actually speak to us speak to us. Is that uh, is that something we want to decide today? Think about. Wait till we see what the survey says. Um, we certainly want that in we certainly want the input from from stakeholders it's um i think and scott if i'm misremembering tell me but there's also an issue if you get into too much give and take it's not that we wouldn't like to all have a conversation with 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 people come to speak but if um that can also uh hard to fit everything in um in a timely basis and that can get off track a bit yeah uh so, so Phil, I, I recommend yes. a listening session as opposed to uh, questioning each one of the um, uh, uh, persons that come to speak before the group, because uh, that can get, it, it really can get elongated, and you take away from the opportunities that others may have, particularly if we set a, a specific time. So, uh, uh, yes, sir, Mr. Moore. Go ahead. Thank you. I was just gonna say, if we send out a written survey first, you could always have a question: Is would you like to come and testify in person? And if you get yep. no answers, then that tells you you don't have to go to the second step if it goes in that sequence. Yeah, I think we can. Otherwise, we can I agree with Scott. Should be a listening yeah. session. You're absolutely right. Totally, listening okay. session. Pete. Yeah, I think uh, the survey really needs to be done first. Let's look at the results of the survey, and then from that we can make a decision on what. Uh, you know, if we need additional input or you know, so a public meeting, uh, I think it would give us a lot of better information. Great. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, let's move on to uh, uh, best practices as it shows up on the agenda. Um, Peter sent around a very thorough list um, a while back of organizations that. Uh, Might be a good source of, uh, of information or speakers or both to talk about best practices and what goes on elsewhere. And um, uh, that's something uh, uh, Elizabeth and Jasmine and I have spoken about a little bit as well. Um, and uh, but I, that's something we identified early on that the commission should uh, should look at. And I would really like to get someone or two. Uh, uh, some folks who would be willing to come uh, and speak to us about best practices and uh, what uh, other uh, counties of uh, of similar size to Baltimore County uh, are doing uh, that is uh, at the forefront of procurement. Um, Elizabeth, I, we talked a little bit about this. I don't uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just curious because I, I think you had an idea, or maybe I'm misremembering and mixing it up with something else. But let me ask you. I know that again, the efficiency study is looking at that. They have a meeting with Rose next week. So again, it's not going to be till maybe May, June, maybe May, where they would have something to share in terms of their benchmarking and best practices. They are not the only source of information clearly, but they're worth hearing from. Um, I think we were doing some research internally. We being budget season, we're a little tapped out to be ready for a presentation in, in the next few weeks. Um, but there might there may be people that the group wants to invite that we could start with, or we could do this a little bit into the early summer months, at least starting with some ideas from the consultants that we already have looking at this. Yeah, on, on, on Peter's list were a, a couple that um, I'm familiar with. And I'm sure everybody else is familiar, probably more than I am, but the National Association of State Procurement Officials and the National Procurement 
um, Institute. Um, does any uh, is anybody um, on the commission? Has anybody run uh, had experience with or run into someone who uh, who you think the commission would uh, be helped by hearing from on on the uh, topic of best practices? Scott, did you see my my statement to you? No. So the answer is no. So if you want to go ahead, if you want to go ahead and state it, I'm sorry, Carla. <laughs> Um, I was the person I was thinking about because they've had ex this experience of both the county and the state level was uh, Major Riddick, and and be, and he understands Maryland, you know, um, Maryland Comar law, uh, all of that. So Major's done it at the county level under Glendenny, state level Glendenny, and then a county level back with uh, um, Angela also Brooks. In a different capacity, but he understands procurement um, at every level. So I'm just thought about him as a as a person that is reachable, gets it on all those on those national uh, association boards of um, oh gosh, I'm, I can see the initials, but I can't say it right. But the administration administrators of it, yeah, so yeah, the procure, he's on a procurement. Um, National organization. He's in the National Forum for Black Public Administrators. He's so he's he, he wears a lot of those titles. You're Thank right. you. I hadn't, thought of, I hadn't thought about major, but but very um, yeah. He's been through a lot. The good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> the good, bad, and the ugly. And the awkward, right? Yeah. And understands even the whole piggyback um, issues. Yeah. Good. Okay. Other other suggestions? Well, let's let's um, let's look into into that. Uh, look into Major Reddick, um, and uh, let let me let me do a little digging on these organizations as well, because it'd be great to hear from a number of different number of different. Uh, Sources, and uh, that may be a that may be a early summer or late May um, a topic. Phil, yes, yes Peter. Um, I think I I think it was in the subcommittee uh, meeting, but one of those national organizations has a Maryland chapter. There are about three hundred members. And um, it might be possible to pull in maybe the president of the organization to talk about the state of, you know, procurement activities in Maryland. Uh, granted, it's everything's been interrupted by uh, working at home and what have you, but uh, they still uh, put together a program uh, both locally and nationally. They have uh, training opportunities and workshops. Uh, some of them are free. Uh, some of them have a tuition payment. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll, um, I'll let me take that. I'll run that down. But that's that's great. Yes, Phil, I did want to weigh in. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Alyssa. Okay, um, I was going to say, and, and this should be reflected in the consultants. I mean, often when we benchmark, it's it's always about our neighboring jurisdictions, but it's also about comparable jurisdictions. And there are certain counties around the country that are more similar to Baltimore County in terms of size and proximity um, to this. It's sort of we're a mix of everything. And so there are, I know a few off the top of my head. So I think if we can get that, be sure the consultants are looking at that or even ask in these organizations, um, you know, volume of contracts, population, everything. That's another way to benchmark and we can talk about that offline. Okay. All right. Anything else on best practices before we move to last agenda items? Okay. Um, so our next meeting is April the 8th and there was some sort of pre official meeting discussion about um, uh, meeting times, and we had initially set these up to be 10 to noon, uh, but I'm sensing um, that uh, having afternoon meetings is uh, 
okay with everybody and um and so for april the 8th do we want to also meet in the afternoon and does this time slot work well would three to five work better um two to four two thirty to four thirty uh thoughts and if anybody is you know, really wants to stay with the morning uh i mean please, please speak up but it's like everybody's thoughts on that while we're all together and we'll schedule accordingly I mean, I, I would prefer like a three to five late afternoon. Six o'clock, it gets a little late. So three to five. I think three to five is preferable. That's fine. Does that work okay? All right. Is that a problem for our, our our friends at the county who can make all this happen? Three to five. Three to five. On the on a particular date, I mean, generally no. I just want to make sure. Are we staying for the eighth? Yes. 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 And that's fine. I don't think. Great. Okay. Um, great. That'd be terrific. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, last thing, Phil, would that apply to the subsequent the, the the further meetings as well? They'll all be now three to five on the that we scheduled. Because I put it in my computer now. It says only this event or all future events. It's, it's okay with me. <laughs> not going to have to touch your computer. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, well, to be all there, I just want my 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 general preference would be, uh, you know, I like the idea that it's on that there are Thursdays and that we know it's, you know, which there, we've been meeting more often, and I think we're going to need to keep doing that for a while. Uh, but I my view would be let's leave it three to five if we find for some Thank reason you. things are things are dropping off um, or there are other problems with the three to five piece that we'll we can uh, we'll re we can always reconsider. Uh, can I ask a general question? Back to another topic. Absolutely. Fire away. Um, so I'm sort of hung up on what Scott said earlier, the relationship between the code and the manual. And Elizabeth, maybe you can clarify that for me now or separately offline. I don't know if everybody else understands it, but um, you know, the code seem my, my naive impression is the code is kind of a basic structure and then gives off to directs the manuals and the purchasing, but maybe it's the other way around. You can just clarify that so I know what I'm looking at when I'm looking at documents. Which is the precedent for Scott's where can answer that. So so interestingly enough, it's odd. I, I think we're odd if I understand it correctly, because the the manual, as I understand it, actually takes precedent over the code from a practical perspective. So in practice, if there is a ambiguity, if there is a question, you go to the manual. Now, Elizabeth, you can correct me or the office of law can correct me, but I think I'm right. Well, I, I, I should think know. Of more, yeah, I think of it more as like, you know, state law and then there's regulation. The law drives the regulation and, and can go into more detail, but that that's how well, I am interpreting it. Sorry, go ahead. Liz. We will we will definitely pose this. I mean, Susan, I think Jasmine, we should email Susan Newman. What I'm also gathering from this whole meeting is that so much practice has evolved. It may or may not be in the manual that it's far exceeded what's in the code. So that's just another layer of what controls. So I think it's it's a really important question to have answered. Um, and we should get an answer back ASAP. Yeah, and I agree. And also, how does the executive order fit in all this? <laughs> right. Now, that, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, and like, like Dan, I'm used to the state system. So the statute says, here's what, here is what we want to have hap what we want to happen. And then the regulations actually walk you through how it happens. But um, if there's a, if there's a conflict, the statute controls because that's, um, that comes from the General Assembly and the regulations come from the executive branch, but the General Assembly sets it up. So uh, interesting separation of powers the questions from time to time, but um, that'd be great to get that answer from, from Susan Elizabeth and we'll get that sorted out. Great, uh, great question. Um, yes, Pete. Uh, back to speakers. Uh, yes. We had we had talked a couple of times about asking the uh, Internal auditor, that's not the right name. 
Inspector uh, General. Inspector General, thank you, uh, to speak to us. I'm still interested if that's still an, op an opportunity. I think it is an opportunity, and I, I've been, um, uh, been reading the report, uh, our most recent report about the procurement uh, involving the uh, uh, the um, ag uh, facility, and, um, and so that I think that's I think it's in the works. I guess is the best way to put it. Elizabeth, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, getting an overview of um, what her under her her work to date around procurement issues would be a good thing. Uh, you know. I don't know that there's any problem with that. And I, I don't know her entire portfolio, so I don't know what else. And she probably can't divulge everything she's looking into. There's a lot of, you know, confidentiality before she issues a report in her investigative context. But um, I can see when she's available. Yeah, yeah it, also, it also could be that, um, and I don't know, much about her background, but it could also be that she's looked at uh, procurement uh, issues or good government issues that would um, have application in the procurement context and could speak to some of that as well, which could help us with our recommendations. So, uh, so the answer is that it is that that is in play, and we I think we'll get her here. Yes, Peter. one more thing, um, yeah. the the dust up this week at the Board of Public Works about some of the uh, COVID emergency procurements uh, reminds me that um, Baltimore County does emergency procurements and they were covered or they were mentioned in the going through of all the different types of contracting um, methods. Uh, but we haven't really tried to nail that down in any way or look at it any further. I didn't know whether uh, it's something that we wanted to take on or not. Well, it's obviously an important topic in a way that I think um, most of us hadn't thought much about before the pandemic. I mean, the, the, the uh, power to conduct a procurement is clearly there, uh, but it was the kinds of things that were emergencies, I think, were uh, not anything as pervasive or extensive um, as the pandemic. So. I think it's worth looking at uh, with respect to county, but I'd be interested to know um, if there is any sort of data kept on how many emergency procurements there have been, uh, and how large a share of the purchasing office's work involves emergency procurements. I don't know if the pandemic has made that more so. Um, it has. It has made the number of uh, emergency procurements go up, and the dollar amount go up. Uh, since I've been monitoring the county council for the last couple of years, um, it can be a lot of money. The last uh, council meeting approved uh, over $2 million. Well, they didn't really approve. It's just reported out. It's different from the Board of Public Works. There's no right. approval required. Uh, but it was over $2 million and 15 contracts, something like that. Just for I know from the construction piece, we discussed the emergency contracts. And I think you raise a good point because I <clears throat> have been asking as companies have come to me about um, COVID and, you know, with the school system and with the, with the county as well as locally. And it, it's really not clear, you know. You know how that was being handled and trying to relay that information back to vendors who were interested. So I think it's a, a topic we should. It doesn't it doesn't really have anything to do with purchasing with the purchasing group. Uh, the decisions are made at the uh, executive level. The memo is written by the director of uh, finance and budget. Budget and finance um, and reported out to the council. So I don't know how to, you know, get at it other than we've looked at the rules of what it takes to do an emergency procurement. Sure. sure. The one thing I want to point out here, which I think would be helpful to the conversation, and I think this was on your original chronology, Phil. I, I know we talked about making sure, you know, the, the, the important 
distinction, but both important of emergency procurement in normal times and then procuring in an emergency, which I don't even, I know the last year has been extraordinary and there were, and that's worth looking at, but it's, it's not the same use of the emergency concept. So I just want to point that out. Well, who, uh, if we wanted to drill down a little bit on on the exercise of uh, emergency procurement power um, by the county, um, who would we speak to? About? Or who should we who should we hear from about? That? that is a good question. I think I mean certainly Susan Dubin, who knows you know how we do it, how how we structure these things from the legal side, but whether we should ask this. Madam CAO to come back. I, I think I think it probably um I mean Rose could certainly share you know her work over the past year, for example, procuring in an emergency. But um I'm I'm personally curious. I don't know how often they've had an emergency. Steve might know. I mean that was I mean yeah, it, this year was longer than ever, I'm sure. But even short term emergency situation. Yeah, Steve, did you occasionally on the public work side, certainly if there's a, a uh, something in the field where there is imminent danger to the public or something like that, that the director of public works, I know had authority. Probably given by the code to procure services in an emergency situation. So if there was a, 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 a broken sewer line that we needed to mobilize quickly that. Um, the department could call a contractor that they knew was nearby or whatever to take care of that situation, follow up with uh, a call to the procurement folks and say, there's an emergency going on, I need to solve this now, and um, follow up with the paperwork, basically justification memos, um, things like that. So it, it is in the code that under emergency circumstances that you can pull that trigger, I think any agency probably could, but it needs to be justified by the director. So, um, and through sort of through channels, so it's in, it's in the code somewhere. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure Rose and Sue could specifically spell out where it is, but I, I know there's provisions for that emergency circumstances and, and it's not used often, or at least in my experience, it was not used often. So, if, I, if I could, because, you know, sure. Bill, you can understand the lawyer in me, um, Dr. Dr. Dan. It is in the code that um, the code gives the the manual um, it makes the manual the precedent. Just so that you know, it's section ten two o five. That that was bothering me. Sorry about that, guys. That's the that's the lawyer piece of it. I uh, you you have you have the respect and admiration of this lawyer. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> right up. Thank you. No, that's great. Um, all right, well, well, Elizabeth, let's let's. Uh, I think the emergency aspect is is significant, and I hear what Steve is saying, and that's great. And those, and but I'm also listening to what Peter is saying in terms of uh, if something happens more from on high as opposed to just um, something that is um, broken water main or the like. Um, so let's let's look at that as uh, as uh, as a topic to get uh, uh, get some information on. Um, have a speaker come in um, and I've got on other meeting topics, obviously best practices we've talked about um, and uh, uh, Dr. Ramsey uh, back. Uh, there's also uh, the sustainability piece also. So we'll, um, we'll get that line. We'll get those lined up. And uh, Phil, we if we're yeah. not able to get Dr. Ramsey, I know Elizabeth said they're going to look at how we can expand her contract. If we're not able to get her, I would um, also like to throw in the name of Zanita Wickham Hurley. Sure. She managed GOMA under the state and um, can talk about best practices from that point of view. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything more on that or anything that um, you would like the commission to focus on? We've got about seven minutes left here and we're all. I'm, I'm back with Scott. 10205, what I got stops at 10204. So what is it again? Uh, uh, Scott, you're 102105. 102105. 
And I and actually I'm getting ready to forward the language to you. Thank you. Is you not the language too? Scott, would you send me the language? Also. All right. Uh, yes, Steve. Mr. Chair, uh, circling back to the survey real quick, Elizabeth, yeah. when you look at the um, survey for the solid waste, could you pull the transportation survey? Because I remember that, and I thought that was pretty good, actually. So if you still have that, that would be interesting to see how that was formulated. Also, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I do. I think I do. Um, and I think, yes, that's one I'm thinking of. We've done more since. I knew that was one on my mind. I think there's one more. So let's pull all three. I'll okay. Think. Great. I know there. I know there's a lot of data in there, so certainly you could draw some conclusions from what it, what came out of it. Great. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth Jasmine. Anything else for the uh, for the commission? Anything else that you uh, logistically or otherwise? Well, I think we solved the time for the next meeting. That was on the agenda. <laughs> that was my primary. All right. Good. Uh, and then we'll ask the subcommittees to uh, to uh, put questions together, and let's let's try to have those in by the by the seventh, and then we'll pull all that together. In the meantime, we'll see what these other surveys look like, um, and we'll uh, work on getting the next. Thank you, Scott. Just, just popped up my email. Um, um, and, forgive me. Um, um, are away. we always set for the third Thursday of the month, or did I miss that? Well, the, we, the, the, uh, the chair, uh, by the power vested in the exact in the executive order, uh, set up these extra meetings just because I, I, I think, I think we need them. Um, the, when we originally scheduled meetings, April the 8th, um, which I think is, that's, that's the, that's the Thursday in the month we'd always picked was on there. Um, I'm thinking we're going to need to continue. These, let's see what happens on the 8th. Maybe we won't need to meet a second time in April, but I, uh, with the interim report coming, uh, your chair is uh, laser focused on that. And so we. Oh, I understand. I'm kind of like Dan. I, if I can make block those date, any future date out, if it's every third Thursday at from three to five, I'll block it out. Otherwise, my calendar will start having other things in it. That's that was really my question yeah. at well, minimum. I, well, here, here's here's the thing because there's a uh, and I we really defer to Elizabeth on this just in terms of just because these are set up so obviously the the public can can watch. Um, I I for one would just as soon block Thursdays, um, and then if we decide we don't need to meet, um, then I not take it. Up. I don't know how much of a I don't know how much of a logistical hassle that is for for Jasmine and Elizabeth, but I would just block them out and assume we're going to need to meet. Um, uh, as we are since every two weeks, and I realize that uh, you know, people will have to miss some meetings, but um, I think it's helpful to us. And we can always decide, hey, you know what, we're in good shape, or we uh, well, we need to take a break and and skip one. So you're saying every two weeks for so the second and the fourth Thursday, okay? And and if Elizabeth and them don't want to do it, I can at least do it on my calendar. So, like you said, if we take it off, great, but at least it's there, and I don't have a conflict. Okay, thank you. Sure. Elizabeth, are we okay with that? Great, thank you. Uh, anything else for the for the good of the order? Well, thank you all very much. Um, pleasure to serve with all of you. Great being with you this afternoon. Thank you for your time and all your efforts. And uh, we'll all be uh, in touch soon. We're adjourned. We're adjourned.